And now let's try and tune in to no good music from an undisclosed location somewhere in New Jersey. That style, the playing guitar. When that comes on, you're out on the dance floor. Miami still rocks, man. Am I going to listen to this again? And that's definitely going to be a theme. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. No. Everybody, this is Rob, and this is Matt, and we are on show forty-seven. Today, That's great. We are going to do something we did last year. I did with Jeremy. Uh, main topic is forgotten bands. Yes, maybe. those who reached popularity, but uh, yeah, we don't maybe. know of them anymore. And they could still be playing shows. <laughs> That's amazing. We'll but hear maybe about we that. Yeah. Still have forgotten about them. Mm-hmm. They've been playing shows longer than you've been alive. That's that's a possibility. Even longer, maybe, than we've been alive. That's pretty sick. remarkable. But we're going to start, before we get into the main topic, mm-hmm. with uh, something we always do. Yeah. And it's, we're going to talk about albums that are turning 50 years old in August. Mm-hmm. And that would be 1973. And then we'll talk about albums turning 40. That would be 1983. And what's interesting about this, Rob... Is that uh, this would be like some of these would be before our time, like before we were able to go out and buy them new because we weren't buying new at age six and, and seven. No, no. And then and then the ones that are turning forty years old, you know, we've we uh, were able to buy those new. We were into them. Yeah, possibly. those are ones we know more. Yeah, yeah. More of. Well, we weren't into them. That's another yeah. possibility. Yeah. I have some music news from August seventy three. Hmm. Oh, also be. Oh, is there is there some water running? I, yeah, hear, I it, hear some water running. All of a sudden, it's pouring down rain, if you hear that in the background. Let's listen. Let's listen. We're not in the shower. Let's listen. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, August 6th, uh, 1973. Stevie Wonder mm. is seriously injured in a car accident outside Durham, North Carolina, and he spent the next four days in a coma. Wow. Now, Matt, do you think he was driving? Yeah, yeah, he could have. They could have let him, you know, Stevie, you drive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so he was injured in the accident. Somehow he was a passenger and yeah. such. Yeah. August 25th, the Allman Brothers, uh, another tragedy. Mm. Well, that near tragedy. Okay. They almost suffer another tragedy when Butch Trucks crashes his car near Macon, Georgia, not far from where Dwayne Allman was killed two years earlier. Wow. Truck survives with only a broken leg. Mm-hmm. Oh, somebody's yes. here. Hello? It's a window open. Really? Or- wow. So the water isn't just running in the toilet. <laughs> Thanks, Carter. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. There's a knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> it- open the door. Something was raining in someone's car, oh. so... But no, we have the yeah. knock on the door. Yeah. So you want to start it from the knock on the door? That's what I was hoping. So um, Butch Trucks, you know, mm-hmm. is in this accident. He survives with only a broken leg. But can you see the headlines? Yeah. Truck crashes, crashes car. Truck crashes car. <laughs> Truck crashes okay, car. That's a stupid joke. <laughs> I was going to ask if he was driving yeah. a truck. I really was. Yeah. So we have some albums that are turning 50, mm-hmm. uh, and this is uh, Leonard Skinnerd mm-hmm. debut album, and it's actually called, pronounced, Lay Nerd Skin Nerd. Lay Nerd Skin Nerd. Yeah, was yeah, released right. on August 13th. Mm-hmm. Uh, were, were people really having trouble pronouncing Leonard Skinner? Leonard, Leonard Skinner? Well... Probably because yeah. Skinner is S K Y, so you might think a sky Skynard, Skynard, yeah. Skynard, yeah, Skynard. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. All right, it's it's 
it's acceptable. It's fair, as my friend would say. So several of the tracks were uh, some of the band's most well-known. Give Me Three Steps, Simple mm-hmm. Man, Tuesday's Gone, and Freebird, of course. And the last of which launched the band to Freebird! national stardom. Mm-hmm. Freebird! Freebird! Now, the cover features all seven members of the band standing on Main Street in Jonesboro, Georgia. But the photo was the last in a long day of shooting for the album cover. Yeah. And Gary Rosington, one of the members, vomited on the sidewalk seconds after it was taken. Wow. So that's good to know. Uh, Kiddos, look that up. Yeah. So if listeners, you know, check that out. And the album is titled, is it self-titled? Pronounced Leonard Skinner. Oh, that's the title. it's spelled out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then with the death of... Guitarist Gary Rosington in 2023, this year, there are no surviving members of the band pictured on the cover. Wow. Next one is Marvin Gaye, released the album Let's Get It On. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. On August 28th, mm-hmm. 1973. Mm-hmm. This is 13th studio album. Mm-hmm. Uh, recording sessions for the album took place during June 1970 to July 1973, so over the period of three years... I'm going to have to edit that out. No, you're not. You will not edit that out. Uh, Hitsville, USA, and Golden Golden World Studio in Detroit, and Hitsville West in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So over three years, following the breakthrough success of his socially conscious album, What's Going On, Mm -hmm. Let's Get It On, helped establish Gay as a sex icon and broaden his mainstream appeal. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Matt, do you know yes. what his next album was called? It wasn't... Okay, so so we are going from What's Going On to Let's Get It On. Yeah. So, um, Did You Leave It On? It, I, I'm guessing no. it would be the next album. This album did not sell well at all. What? And it was called Get the F*** Out of My House, <laughs> Actually, that's, that's not what... That's great. <laughs> No, I'm just making that up. Oh, um, that would be great if it was called that. What's going down? Yeah. Is, is that it? I don't know what the <laughs> next album was called. Mm-hmm. So let's get it on produced three singles, a title track, and come get to this. Mm-hmm. And you sure love the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Taste me. Taste me. Uh, <laughs> now, I've heard the song Let's Get It On, but I haven't really. i got to listen to the album. Next one is the Rolling Stones, Goat's Head Soup. Oh, yes, yes. <clears throat> Very well known. Which sounds really disgusting to me. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a thing. August 31st, 1973. It's the 11th. Now, this is what's weird. It's the 11th British and 13th American studio album. So at the time, they, they released more American releases than English. Yeah. Or British, yeah. Mm-hmm. The album contains 10 tracks, including the lead single... And also Angie, which is a good song. Yeah. You know, as far as the Stones go, I, I really like Angie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Angie went to number one as a single in the U.S. And the sessions for Goat's Head Soup were abundant with outtakes, two of these tops, and Waiting on a Friend, yeah. which wouldn't surface until Tattoo You in 1981, hmm. which I had. And then two other albums to check out, which we won't go into detail, are Golden Earring, Moon Tan, Mm -hmm. which included Radar Love. Yeah. And the album Yeah by Brownsville Station, which included the song Smoking in the Boys Room. Yeah. Which I only first heard from Motley Crue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember it from the 70s. I'm trying to think... What's the name of the band again? Brownsville Station. Never would have known that. Yeah. Smoking in the Boys Room. It's one of those bands, you know the song, but you could never name the band. Brownsville. Yeah. Station. (laughs) Wow. Now we're going to 1983, which we're more familiar with. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got some music news. August 16th, Johnny Ramone from the Ramones, of course, suffers a near fatal head injury during a fight over a girl in front of his East Village apartment. Okay, so it wasn't during performance, like a, a bottle didn't hit him no. in the head or anything. Oh, and there's just regular fight. And there's no uh, more detail. I'm, maybe there's a news article but <laughs> as to how that happened. Maybe, uh, you know, was pushed or who knows. Singer Paul Simon 
mm-hmm. marries this same day, August 16th, oh. marries actress Carrie Fisher. And supposedly after the honeymoon, he bragged that he got Princess Leia. <laughs> you bum. made that up, Princess Leia. Okay. No, I did not know. kind of explicit. I, I didn't know. So this is 1983. Yeah. That Paul and Carrie got married. Yeah. No, I didn't know that. And he, he gets, said after marrying Carrie that he almost felt like he was five foot four. <laughs> it's good. Because it's good. Because our listeners, Paul Simon is five foot three. Yeah. And Carrie Fisher is five foot one. Yeah. So he yeah. he he was yeah. yeah. He almost That's felt cr- like he was five foot. Okay, we got it. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, August 20th, the mm-hmm. Rolling Stones signed a new $28 million contract with CBS Records. Wow, that was a lot back then. Well, it was the largest recording contract in the history mm-hmm. of contracts at this mm-hmm. time. You realize that LeBron only needs to work for about three days to make that money. Just saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just saying. <laughs> Just... That's, that is true. Okay, albums uh, that are turning 40. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is for August 1983. Jackson Brown, yeah. released on August 2nd. Lawyers in Love, it was his seventh album, reached number eight on Billboard Pop album charts. I love, I don't know, I love this, the, that song. Mm-hmm. It was a nice, happy, just kind of odd song. But, yeah. Uh, it was Brown's fourth straight top 10 album and stayed on the charts for 33 weeks. I did not know. I, yeah. I wasn't aware. And out of the eight tracks, four were released as singles. The title song was a top 20 hit. For Brown and his last on the American pop charts. Mm. And it was accompanied by one of the first music videos released on MTV. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Wow. Because, yeah, you know, we can discuss this some other time, but MTV started putting out videos. Do you you remember? It was somewhere right before there. It was like 81, I think. Yeah, 81, 82. So this is early on in there. Yeah. And the album also had the song, which you may know, Tender is the Night. Yes. Great songs. Mm Mm-hmm. Now we got one that I, I love and had was Billy Joel's An Innocent Man, mm-hmm. uh, August 8th, 1983, it was released. And this was the ninth studio album by Billy Joel. And the album uh, is a concept album and a tribute to the American popular music of Joel's adolescent years. Mm. And Joel is paying homage to a number of different and popular American musical styles from the late 50s to early 60s, and most notably doo-wop and soul music right and if you didn't know that you would yeah. you would wonder oh this song sounds like it's reaching yeah. back and then the next song hey this sounds like it's reaching back mm-hmm. you know so um, i remember hearing just some songs and thinking and we tell you about these albums because you know it's i like listening to an album maybe near its anniversary and also if you've never listened to these albums these are good i tried to pull out some good albums yeah if you want to recreate the cover it was taken on the front steps of 142 Mercer Street in the Soho neighborhood of Manhattan. Okay. So go there. Not Phillipsburg, not Mercer yeah. Street that we know and love. Yeah. Phillipsburg. So 142 Mercer Street. Yeah. Get over mm-hmm. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the album featured three top 10 singles. Mm-hmm. Tell her about it. Oh, yeah. Big, 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 number, big. Went to number one. Uptown Girl. Mm-hmm. Which was, uh, and this was while Billy was dating Christy Brinkley. Mm-hmm. Is that the, that video has the car and she's in the car, mm-hmm. Uptown Girl, and they just keep showing her in the car? I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. Isn't he, a, he's a mechanic. Oh, uh, yeah. I think. I he's just wearing pictured... a uh, jumpsuit. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. fake dirt on it. Yeah, yeah. chocolate <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. And also An Innocent Man went to number 10. And the other song is The Longest Time, which is a great song. Yes. What went to only 14. Mm-hmm. I believe that's acapella and finger snaps, right? It just, mm-hmm. yeah, this yeah. is just a great overall mm-hmm. album. And then we can't leave 1983 without mentioning Cheap Trick. Oh, uh, I thought you'd mentioned Depeche Mode, but go yeah. ahead. They released their seventh studio album called Next Position, Please, which I actually have on the wall. Yes, right yes, now. it is. Uh, Matt, if you look at the cover, I'm looking at it right now on your wall of the studio. The cover is a parody of Bruce Springsteen's pose on the cover of Born to Run. Yeah, yeah. And the guitar on the cover is Rick Nielsen's Hammer Double Neck. Yes. And you know what it's called? It's called The Rick. It's called Uncle Dick. (laughs) 
it, the uh, the guitar is very unique. It's yellow, yeah. black, and white, and it's a two neck guitar. And so each of the necks represents yeah. a leg yeah. of Rick Nelson. Yeah. And uh, the where the tuning pegs are, that's that's the feet. Yeah. And uh, and he still amazing. plays this guitar. Uh, wow. If you see them live, we'll bring that guitar mm. out, Uncle Dick. The album. <laughs> Now, the album was produced by Todd Rundgren. Oh, yeah. Good friend of theirs, I'm sure. Yeah. And the title track was originally demoed for the band's 1979 album, Dream Police. Mm -hmm. It originally had Robin Zander, Rick Nelson, and Tom Peterson each singing a verse. Mm -hmm. But the song they ended up with is just Robin singing. Yeah. I can tell where that title came from. Next position, please. Mm -hmm. It's kind of obvious, like, to me, when I look at the album cover, I know it's a photo shoot, and the photographer, after he snaps a couple photos, this is back in the days of film, probably, yeah. he would say, next position, please. Mm -hmm. And then they would they would move about, you know. Remember, remember they're, they're musicians. They're not fashion models, and so they're yeah. not used to this. Yeah. Next position, please. Mm -hmm. Next position, please. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Next position, please. You know, let me see if I got that here. I think I have that right here. And this is not... Here we go. This wasn't one of their best albums because it only got peaked at number 61. All right, listen to this. Oh, never mind. Didn't have... Okay. Didn't... Just supposed to make you that... You played Duran Duran with the... No, the camera right. sound. I'm trying yeah. to get that camera sound. It's... Why is well, it... play Girls on Film and you'll get that. No, but it's... I have my... Oh. I have my phone camera. It's supposed to make that sound. Oh, yeah. You got to turn the... Flick the switch. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I did that already. <laughs> what the heck going on? We'll edit the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's some other, a uh, couple other albums to check out. Yeah, yeah. 1983 is Elvis Costello punched a clock. Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. And from that album, we have which which hit comes out of that? Every day I write the book. Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows the the lyrics. Find strange hands in your sweater. You know, it's just a little. Mm -hmm. You just wonder about that. Yeah, makes it makes you think. <laughs> you know, and then from that album, I, I I was listening to it and I I know the song Shipbuilding yeah. and we'll be shipbuilding and I I don't know how I how I, I don't that. yeah I don't because know. I never owned the album. I never bought it for myself. Hmm. I was too poor. Maybe yeah. someone else played it. For yeah, you. yeah. And then we have Stray Cats, rant and rave with the Stray Cats. And the song off that album is a song you probably, I don't know, it's debatable whether you can write a certain song today or not. Mm -hmm. Because I always have this thing with the, uh, the top 40 and some of the songs on there are kind of raunchy. Hmm. So I don't know why sometimes they pick on the older songs as far as... So anyway, the single, yeah, yeah, yeah. the mm -hmm. song was Sexy and Seventeen. Sexy. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. It just has the word sex in it, I guess, that the, uh, yeah. Yeah. Not so, approved. Unapproved. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Kajagoogoo. Do you remember Kajagoogoo? Too Shy to Shy. It Too, makes no yeah. sense at all. Absolutely. And their album, I Dare Anybody to Name, uh, is... I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Kajagoogoo. Kajagoogoo. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome to the Thunderdome. <laughs> That was Tina Turner. What you lose there? Uh, some electronic device. It's gone. Uh, it's gone. We, we don't need it. We don't need it anymore. The plug? No, no. The sound machine. The uh, sound effects. Uh, it's gone. <clears throat> it's gone. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the album was White Feathers. Yeah. Never would have gotten no. that. Never. And then we had Herbie... Can Herbie Hancock. Herbie Hancock. <laughs> Future Shock. Yes song rocket and i yeah. clearly remember the video yeah no i did i did have rocket the ep with four different versions of rocket on it really yep. mm -hmm. black and white and red cover i did not know yeah i yeah, loved it i might have not shared it with you i don't know i don't remember sharing it with you then that's sad yeah that you didn't share yeah. that with rocket me. Okay, so next up, we have some new albums coming out. Uh, before that, though, before yeah. that, I have to go back to yeah. albums from 50 years ago. <clears throat> you said uh, the album called It's Pronounced Leonard Skinner. Yeah. Yeah. So here I have the picture, and uh, I want you listeners to also look it up. You can just go to Apple Music or anything, and you see the album cover. It has all seven of the guys there. 
Yeah. And uh, I want you to try and guess which one looks like he's about to throw up. And it's, it's clear to me. Uh, so, Rob, just take a little look there. I, th- I have a guess, and it's in my head. I didn't write it down. But one of them is about to throw up. I think it's the one in the very back. N- okay, very back, because he's looking for an escape route. That's why he's in the back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you have that one in the very back. Oh, you know what? His face is blurry. It's not, it's not in focus. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I think it's clearly the man in purple, second from the left. He is thinking hard. He's thinking, I'm about okay. to throw up. Yeah, yeah. he might yeah. be right. So, so we have two <clears throat> possibilities there. It's nobody else. It's, it's one of those two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know all the, all the members. That's why I said man wearing well, the Well, I'm purple. sure we sure. know. We can find out. Yeah, yeah. So if any of you yeah, listeners know. want to put a bet on this, which one of the members at Leonard Skinner is about to throw up? Without really knowing who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To play fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What'd you have next there, Rob? So next we have uh, new releases. Cool. These are for August, mm-hmm. new album releases. August 4th, we got uh, Mammoth, which, Matt, you might not know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do it's not. Wolfgang Van Halen. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this is Mammoth 2. And Jeremy and I actually went and saw them. He is incredible. Mm-hmm. He has a full band. Yeah. He was opening, believe it or not. He did his own tour when that first album came out. But he was opening for a band called Alter Bridge, mm-hmm. which are kind of heavy. Mm-hmm. Not um, heavy metal, but hard rock. Yeah. And I was surprised he was opening and tickets were like 35 bucks. Oh, that's cool. And it was at a um, little place, uh, I think in, I think it was Reading. I forget where we went. Because sometimes we go to Reading, sometimes we've gone to Strasbourg. Okay, so August 11th. Oh, wait a second. So Mammoth, what's, what's with the theme? Mammoth one, Mammoth two. What's what does Mammoth mean to him? Well, that's the name of the band. Oh. Maybe a big sound. Maybe yeah, a yes, yes, sound. yeah. Got it. I yeah. think yeah, yeah. Okay, just checking. well, it's M A M M O T H Mammoth. So I don't know if it's like Woolly Mammoth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like Mammoth, New Jersey. That's Monmouth. <laughs> that's Monmouth. Yeah, yeah. never. Mind. <laughs> August 11th, a mm-hmm. band I have not heard of in a long time, and it's Public Image Limited. We saw them. And it's called End of, End, End of World. Not End of the World. <laughs> End of World. Just using yeah. less words. Yeah. Another band I haven't heard of in a long time is The Hives, The Death of Randy Fitzsimmons. Don't know who Randy is. Mm-hmm. May he rest in yeah. peace. Uh, we got Liam Gallagher from Oasis. Yes. And it's a live concert. Uh, Nebworth 22. I understand it's from 2022. Mm-hmm. So there is Noel Gallagher who has his own band, the High Flying Birds. And then Liam is kind of on his, doesn't have, he has a band, but I guess he, he just goes by. And Liam and, you know, Noel don't, we've talked about them before. They don't really get along too good as brothers anymore. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they're doing their own thing. And Liam's last album I really liked. It was, I was surprised. It was really good. Uh, we got David Bowie. He doesn't have a new one out. No, I wouldn't suspect. But it is the 50th anniversary of the motion picture soundtrack Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Very cool. So check that out. I was listening to uh, WXPN in Philly, and there was a show... Uh, probably um uh commemorating mm-hmm. the fifth that 50th anniversary yeah there was uh, uh i think it was a whole saturday or a whole weekend of okay. festivities for bowie mm-hmm. uh, for that event yeah and okay. that was a few weeks back and then august 18th we got another band i haven't heard of in a long time sonic youth yeah but this is uh from a concert from 2011 live in brooklyn uh we got hosier Hosier. You know, it's not easy to say. Yeah, I know. Hosier. 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 Yeah. Unreal yeah. Unearth, it's called. I'd like to check it out. I'd like, I like this stuff from the last album. And we got someone that I love, and I don't think she's put out anything in, in a little while, is Grace Potter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mother Road. 
Yeah. It's called. We did get to see her uh, at Hershey. Is that right? Was that Grace Potter? Yeah. Back in uh, tw- 2012. Yeah. And then I saw her when it was at Sands in Bethlehem. Mm-hmm. Front row. Nice. Got some great photos. Mm-hmm. It was it used to be Grace Potter and the Nocturnals. Mm-hmm. But this is a new album, August 18th. I already ordered the vinyl, uh, which is signed, which is on yellow vinyl. Yeah. August 25th, we had uh, Husker Du. Husker Du. Oh, yeah, it is Husker. I remember yeah. being corrected once. Husker Du, yeah. not Husker Du. Mm-hmm. And I did look this up because I was curious as if this was new or not. And it's, it's not. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering if I can't picture Husker mm-hmm. Du still putting out music uh, honestly i can't i think it's a compilation of past maybe it's rare stuff it's called tonight longhorn <laughs> <laughs> i guess uh, and then august 25th the same day we got alice cooper no brand new album no yes well we were holding two in our hands not long ago yep yeah called road and i the road. first single i think is called something like um uh, I'm Alice or something like that. Yeah, hello, I'm Alice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I listened to the first single and I have to say, even though I'm a huge fan, I, I don't think the song's that great. I'm hoping... Maybe the rest will get better. He had an yeah. album out a couple of years ago and I'm pretty sure it was called Detroit Stories mm-hmm. and it was a great album because mm-hmm. it was, so, it was I think, a lot of cover songs mm-hmm. and it was great. So I'm hoping for more greatness, but... So there we go. Those are new very releases. Good, very good. So check those out. Uh, even if you're listening to <clears> this <throat> at a later date, you can still look back a few months and check them out. So, Rob, what do we have next here? We uh, we are looking at Forgotten Bands, is that right? Yes. Okay. And these are old bands, mainly from the 70s, around 73. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that they debuted then, but mm-hmm. around that time period, they were producing... But they made it big. Mm-hmm. These, are, these are big names. So, if we go back to the early 70s, these could be household names. Yeah. Keep, people could be saying, like, the Groundhogs... Oh, did you yeah. get that new Groundhogs album? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah they well, got um, mm-hmm. radio airplay on the rock and roll. Mm-hmm. It wasn't called classic rock back then because yeah. it was new. When classic cars <laughs> were new, they did not call them classic. Yeah. Yeah, they said, look at this new car. I got a new car. <laughs> yeah. What what might be, uh, Quarter Moss would be another one. What were some other ones that uh, could be? Well, the first uh, podcast we did, we didn't really call it Forgotten Bands. I think we called it... Um, uh, I think we called it odd. <laughs> yeah, but what are some? But what are some names that could be? Uh, I mentioned two there already. Uh, you might be looking at. Well, last year Jeremy and I did like uh, Still I Span. That's right. Uriah Heep. Yeah. Right. Uh, even uh, one we just talked about is um, uh, Golden Earring. Jeremy yeah. did. Right. You right. know. Right. And like Steel Eye Span, you know, I told you one of my uh, former bandmates in Virginia, like they, they praised Steel Eye Span, like they talked about Steel Eye Span, yeah. like people would talk about Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. Mm-hmm. They would say, yeah, like Steel Eye Span. Yeah. So, yeah, it's if you're in certain communities, uh, it just looks different that way. So, yeah. Um, you want me to go first? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, 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 let me start out. Let me okay. start out and you can... Okay. Okay. First one I have, uh, not a household name as I've known it, mm-hmm. Wishbone Ash. Yes. Yeah. British rock band. And they have been doing it for so long that they have, you ready for it? No. 26 albums. Wow. Yeah. 26 albums. And that is spanning from 1970 to 2020. Yeah. Wow. So from 1970, when I was uh, learning my numbers from one to ten mm-hmm. yeah they they were making music uh first one wishbone ash and then some other albums such as pilgrimage and argus now it happens that they hit their commercial peak with that third album argus okay yeah and then they continue to make um 
Oh, some of them are electronic re-recordings. They redid some things. Some album titles such as uh, Where's the Rub? <laughs> Excuse me, it's There's the Rub. What? There's the Rub. There's like, the Rub. Yeah, There's the Rub. Locked in, New England, front page news, No Smoke Without Fire, Two Barrels Burning. Yeah, and, to the, yeah just, just some album titles. And look up that album cover, There's the Rub. Yeah. Uh, by Wishbone Ash. And tell us what's going on there. The guy's holding something. That it's. It looks to me like it could be a yo-yo mm-hmm. and he's and it's red and mm-hmm. then he's got a red mark on his pants like near, it's, near the crotchety section yeah near the zipper but yeah. it's i can't figure out matt and i can't figure yeah. out what he's holding yeah it looked like an apple at first yeah. but it's not an apple i've seen i've seen some like in my wife's cosmetic bag mm-hmm. it's the size of a yo-yo like, do you open it up and there's rouge in there? Oh, yeah. Maybe it's rouge. Might be a compact. I just like I think to, they call yeah, it a compact. I just like to say the word rouge. Yeah. You know, yeah. I bet you, I bet you if you look up... Moulin Rouge. If you look up the word red in French, it's probably mm. rouge. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we're, we're, but he got some on his pants. Yeah, yeah. So, Wishbone Ash are noted for their extensive use of harmony twin lead guitars. So... You got two guitars and they're playing in harmony. So you're playing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Just like when vocalists uh, sing over themselves. Yeah. It's nice and rich. They're singing actually not, they're singing over themselves. So uh, this was first uh, made popular by Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page playing together in the Yardbirds Mm -hmm. in my birth year. Uh, So that was interesting that people, uh, they they like that, that, that feel. Yeah, um, doubling up. On yeah, the doubling guitars. up on the on the electric leads. Yeah, several b- bands have noted Wishbone Ash as an influence. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, Iron Maiden. Okay, Van Halen, Leonard Skinnerd, <laughs> Thin Lizzy. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine Thin Lizzy? Thin Lizzy. Did you ever, did you ever hear have, you listeners? Have you heard of Thin Lizzy and Metallica? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to name a few. They have said Wishbone Ash. Uh, has been an influence on me. In 1970, uh, they opened up for Deep Purple, and um, Richie Blackmore recommended Wishbone Ash to a producer, Derek Lawrence, and got him a record deal. So I thought that was pretty cool. And Richie Blackmore is yeah. Black Sabbath, wasn't he? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, Richie Blackmore. I just know the name. Bassist and vocalist John Wetton joined the group, formerly with King Crimson, Roxy Music, and Uriah Heat. Huh? You're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another band that uh, we haven't heard of lately. So yeah, they've they've got um, looking at some material here. They that it's it's amazing that they total 26 albums. I think it would be um, if you're not re- including the re-recordings, it would be uh, 23 actual albums of okay. new material. Yeah. And there you have it, Wishbone Ash mm-hmm. in the early 70s. In the music circuits, uh, a and common, still around, a common name, and still doing after all these years. But some of these bands, they, you know, they may have one member that was original. Yeah, and one that comes to mind is Foreigner, which I believe now doesn't even have one original member. Wow, uh, because there's a new lead singer, but uh, I think it was Lou Graham. Who, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was Mick Jones. Lou Graham, though, I think was touring with them uh recently mm-hmm. but i i don't know if he's still with if he's not with them then they have no original yeah member. so <laughs> can they call themselves so it's like a that's cover it's, band yeah yeah it's one of those bands that yeah just play that's interesting all the same. yeah you know once you lose your last original member you suddenly are a cover band you suddenly are doing foreigner songs well yeah because yeah. you have people that have not they didn't write any of those songs mm-hmm they're just singing them yeah, and they're yeah. just playing them. So that is literally a cover band. You know? Do you know, my brother had the eight track of head games, far yeah. head games. Mm-hmm. We're talking um, probably 82, something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom and dad said, uh, you will not have music like that in our house. And it was a girl sitting on a toilet, if I remember. No, it was a girl writing on the men's bathroom wall near a urinal. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, so um, mm-hmm. I said, I will get rid of it. What I was referring to was the paper cover on the 8-track. So I, I, I steamed it and got oh, rid of okay. the paper cover. Nice. So I had a, a very uh, black, uh, mm-hmm. plain 8-track for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So and I did listen get, to it with the headphones on. Yeah. And, uh, Head games with the headphones. Double Vision, I, 
I have that now. I I love Foreigner. I mm-hmm. like. I listen to Foreigner up until four. Mm-hmm. Four. I won't go into too much detail, but I it was going to the Jersey Shore yeah. and Wildwood, like yeah. we always did every year. Yeah, going up on the boardwalk, putting your quarter down for a gamble. Yeah, I um. I actually, I would watch the will with if that meant anything, but maybe I was just lucky that day. But mm-hmm. I think I put the quarter or 50 cents down. Mm-hmm. On the spinning wheel. And won on the first time, and it was the 8-track of four. Wow. And I actually had a portable 8-track player. I did too. At, I did Back too. at the motel. Yeah. And that's what I listened to that week. <laughs> with Urgent on it. Um, and Jukebox Hero. Oh, my God. Yeah. If I, I have that album... <laughs> but it's it's those it's this it's songs that you list and just take you back. Yeah. If you we know. if we can do this podcast ten years from now, maybe Foreigner will make the, one of the forgotten bands. That's what list. I well, I was thinking about David Bowie. Yeah. Because the person we interviewed today, we did a couple interviews today, which you'll yeah. hear coming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, Both in. Memphis, both in both in Tennessee, both in Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we can say his name, Jesse Daniel Edwards, mm-hmm. uh, a newer artist. But he mentioned uh, he ran into someone that never heard of David Bowie. I think it was an ex-girlfriend. Okay, he dated yeah. someone who didn't know David Bowie. And that interview should be coming out after this. So maybe anyway, she, maybe she was eighteen. I don't. <laughs> so uh, what do you got for us next? I got Alberto. Eight- April Wine. Yes. Oh, I, now, I have two I bands had, on my list that are food. I had an April Wine album. That's all mm-hmm. I remember. I didn't listen to okay. it. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, believe it or not, out of my well, Matt and I picked uh, three bands each from a list of about fifty. Believe yeah, it or not, yeah. yeah. But we wanted uh, bands that had a little bit of history. Mm-hmm. Because there are the really forgotten bands that maybe put out an album or two. You know, we we really want to talk, you know, give you some information, uh, some good information. Mm-hmm. But I have two two of my three bands are food products. Yes. Uh, if you want to call wine yeah, food. Yeah, it's liquid food. Yeah. yeah. Nourishment for the soul. So this band is from Canada, and they formed in 1969. They're sort of from Canada because it's Halifax, Nova Scotia, actually. Yes. Um, but they're considered a Canadian rock band. Yeah. The band is led by singer, guitarist, songwriter Miles Goodwin since its, since its inception. Mm-hmm. And even though they officially began in 1969 in Waverly, Nova Scotia, uh, the roots can be traced back to Newfoundland and mm-hmm. Labrador, which I've never heard of. Yeah, yeah. Where brothers David and Richie Henman grew up playing music together before they moved to Nova Scotia. So three of the founding members, uh, we got David Henman, Richie Henman, their cousin Jim Henman, Howard Hessman. No, I'm just making that up. Uh, <laughs> you could have thrown that in. WKRP. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they were it- originally in a band named Prism. And uh, after a brief break, the trio reformed with Miles Goodwin on lead vocals and guitar. Goodwin had previously been in a band called The Termites with Jim. Hmm. And David Henman christened the new group April Wine. They realized that Halifax did not provide the opportunities to play and record. They sent a demo tape to Aquarius Records in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Now, Aquarius managers Terry Flood and Donald K. Tarleton returned a rejection letter. But somehow, the band mistook it for an invitation. (laughs) We got a letter. Yeah. No way. We got a letter. So on April 1st, 1970, April Wine went to Montreal bringing with them their instruments and $100 in cash. Flood and Tarleton were persuaded to sign the band to a contract. (laughs) Were they drunk? (laughs) We'll we'll take it. Yeah. Uh, They then spent the next five months touring Eastern Canada. Mm. The band recorded and released their self-titled debut album in September 71. And the album included a single Fast Train, which was a top 40 hit in Canada. Now, Jim Henman left the band in 1971. He was replaced by Jim Clench. And in 1971, uh, they toured the college circuit, with the exception of July 30th, when they opened at Montreal's Place de Nations for the Guess Who. So I guess that was a big thing uh, to open for the Guess Who. Mm -hmm. 
And which it, would be another another band we could you know mm -hmm. have on this list. Oh yeah, the Guess Who. I think they were on the list. <laughs> <laughs> So in uh, 72, they even got to open for bigger acts like Tina Turner, Jethro Tull, Badfinger, and Stevie Wonder. In 72, they recorded their second album. The first single was a cover version of the Hot Chocolate song, You Could Have Been a Lady. Hmm. Now, I'm not real familiar with April Wine. I don't think I could name a song, but they do have a pleasant sound. They do yeah, yeah. have an appealing sound to them. So then while the band was recording their third album, uh, David and Richie Henman, they quit. And Goodwin and Clench held auditions, and the replacements were drummer Jerry Mercer and guitarist Gary Moffat. They finished the album, and uh, by 1975, they released their fifth album, and it went double platinum in Canada. Huh. Uh, and it had the singles, Tonight is a Wonderful Time to Fall in Love, and I Wouldn't Want to Lose Your Love. Still don't know those songs. Yeah, yeah, you know, I find it so interesting, my friend, that I'm looking... I, I owned an April Wine album. I remember it. Okay. Because I bought really? it... Really? Yeah, I bought it used, so it was probably like a buck ninety-five or two ninety-five. I remember it was worn as well, and I had, don't have any memory listening to it. Mm -hmm. But as I research in Apple Music, these are the greatest hits, and the greatest hits are Fast Train, Drop Your Guns. Mm-hmm. Uwatan, Uwatan tonight. Uwatan tonight. <laughs> waka, it's, waka, waka. It's, it's one word. <laughs> Weeping Widow. I don't know any of these songs. Yeah. So that's pretty weird that I would, I would own an album, not listen to it. And on Z95, on all the radio stations, they didn't play any of their music. I'm going to say they were mostly uh, popular in Canada. Yeah. It must a, be, yeah. Not more a U.S. band, but they did tour, you know, the U.S. But on what, you know magic carpet on what wave of popularity yeah after the fifth album they actually went on tour with heart and then a band i don't think i've heard of but when i say the name i'm gonna laugh thunder mug but it sounds thunder familiar mug. i think we thunder mentioned mug. yeah why does thunder mugs <laughs> sound familiar? thunder mug number one hit fast train you know maybe maybe people in canada will will be will tune in will listen to us and yeah. And give us those in Nova Scotia and Labrador. If you're living in Labrador, please uh, contact us. And let I do us have know. a friend in Canada. His yeah. name's Nathan. Yeah. He's in a Beatles band. Oh. So, Nathan Liu, you listening? I'm sure you know who April Wine is. Yes. So, the band's next release was in 76, and it actually hit platinum status based on advanced sales orders alone. Hmm. Uh, and their sixth album, uh, Forever For Now, was another platinum seller. And it contained the band's biggest single, You Won't Dance With Me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know it. Yeah. And I'm still not knowing it. Now, something interesting on um, March 4th and 5th, 77, mm -hmm. we're up to 77 Yeah, now. yeah, that's good. April Wine was booked to play at a charity concert at Toronto's famed El Macombro, Macombo Club. And the co-liner on the bill was a band called The Cockroaches. Mm-hmm. The Cockroaches turned out to be the Rolling Stones. No. Yeah. And the pseudonym was a poorly kept secret, and huge crowds turned out for the event. Uh, April Wine's performance was captured and released as the album Live at the El Macombo. And then the band got its first chance at touring the U.S. So here we go. So up until now, mm -hmm. Canada, not much in the U.S. as far as releases. And they got to open for the Rolling Stones, Styx, and Rush. Well, wow. and we know those names. Yes, yes. Rush being Canadian, right? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Sticks. Uh, I'm not sure where they originate from. Now their seventh album. Uh, it wasn't until their third single uh, called Roller. And my friend Ken knew this song. He knows a little bit more about them, a lot mm -hmm. more than I know. Um, mm -hmm. And that brought the band mass appeal across North America. Roller. 79 yeah. was spent touring with Styx, Rush, Toto, Boston, Squeeze, and Blue Oyster Cult. Squeeze. They found a way to... to wow. Okay. Yeah. It sounds a little different than, than Squeeze. Oh, no, wait. I do know two songs. We're getting to it. Oh. Okay. And when I mention them, you probably know. Yeah, yeah. So that this was... Uh, we're going into the 80s now. The Nature of the Beast was released in January 81. Okay. And it had the hit singles, Just Between You and Me, which yes. I love. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. I, I, I lied. Yeah. And the band's cover of the Lawrence, Lawrence Hud song, Sign of the Gypsy Queen. I know you've heard that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have to apologize. I was reading not from their greatest hits, mm-hmm. per se, but from their album called Greatest Hits. Oh, okay. They put out an album, Greatest Hits, when mm-hmm. there's no hits on it that we know. That's what I was reading from. So uh, I was wrong on that. And just between you and me, is yeah. that what you said? Yeah, and Sign of the Gypsy Queen. Yeah, which so, I, w- I would know both of those. So listeners, check out yeah. Just Between You and Me, that mm-hmm. incredible mm-hmm. ballad. And now this was the first album to reach platinum status, interna- platinum status internationally. Mm-hmm. So the band had kind of a lull uh, from 85. Mm-hmm. They didn't release their next album until 93. So, yeah, that's that's eight years, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I don't know. They probably disbanded, um, you know, broke up. Maybe they were still playing shows. Now, in 2010, they were inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. And sadly, on November 3rd, 2010, Jim Clench died in Montreal of lung cancer. He was 61. But April Wine continues, tour across Canada annually. They yeah. play festivals in Europe and the United States. And the group uh, consists of Goodwin, Greenway, Lanthier and drummer Roy Nip Nickel. Nip. Mm-hmm. Play them again for us, Nip. They played their most recent concert in Ottawa in September 2021. Now, Miles Goodwin, who was the singer, he will no longer be touring with the band. He announced December 2022. Mm-hmm. Uh, he turned his vocal and guitar duties to Mark Parent, but he's still a part of the band. He's just not touring with the band. He's going to focus on writing and recording. So they're still active. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel this band, if you want to uh, know what they sound like, we can't really, we can't play their music, unfortunately. But think of another maybe forgotten Mm -hmm. band is 38 Special. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was thinking maybe REO Speedwagon, just uh, mm -hmm. between you and me. It just sounds like uh, it could be be a band like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing a rock ballad, right? Nice, great rock Mm -hmm. ballad, actually. I've even heard some cheap trick kind of in there mm-hmm. but we're mentioning bands you probably don't know either <laughs> uh i don't know any newer artists that we can compare them to right right um you know they're no harry styles i can tell you mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. but the, the two songs that i do know they're they're great songs but i do get the feeling they sounded uh, i listened to more songs and i think they sounded like the problem was they sounded like every other rock band of the 80s yeah i think just between you and me though is one of the best songs mm-hmm. ever written it's yeah and I think it's, uh, if you know the song Love Hurts, or I even have down yeah. here, believe it or not, because you mentioned Aria Speedwagon, yeah. Keep On Loving You. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very similar to that feel. Yeah. 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 So. All right. So April 1. Good, good. Uh, next up, I have a person, not a band, and uh, not a whole lot on her, but uh, Ellen McElwain. And she is Nashville born. So again, Nashville is definitely the word of the day. Uh, Born in Nashville, Tennessee, but she was adopted by Christian missionaries and moved to Japan. So she's American born, but she's growing up in this Japanese uh, culture. Uh, She learned multiple languages, knew a lot about Japanese culture, and um, she attended a a Canadian, there you go, Mm -hmm. Canadian Academy there in Japan. And uh, she was playing piano, started playing piano on her own, uh, playing Ray Ray Charles, Fats Domino, and uh, some other different Japanese songs that she heard on the radio. She began her stage career in Atlanta, Georgia, in the mid-1960s. So she's she's a singer-songwriter and coming into being in the mid-60s when a lot of uh, the folk revival was, was beginning. So she lived in Greenwich Village, mm-hmm. and she had a gig opening every night uh, at Cafe Agogo. So she played along with Jimi Hendrix. She mm-hmm. opened up for Muddy Waters and some other people uh, popular during the time. Uh, found that really interesting. She had strong roots in blues and gospel and rock. But people kept trying to say she's a folk singer. She's a folk mm-hmm. singer. Yeah. Because it's a woman alone with her guitar in the late 60s. And it's mm-hmm. like, oh, you must be a folk singer. Yeah. Very similar to uh, Joan Baez and Melanie mm-hmm. and uh, people of the time. So, but yes, yeah, she did cover version of Isaac Hayes, Stevie Wonder, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Steve Winwood, Jack Bruce, singing some of her own songs as well. So uh, she toured 
Now jumping ahead from the 60s, from way back to just 2008, 2009, and 2010, uh, she toured with Patty Larkin. Now I saw Patty Larkin uh, open up one time uh, with uh, Bruce Coburn uh, in DC back in 1994. So yeah, it's, it's singer songwriter. It's a woman and her guitar telling mm-hmm. a story. Uh, yeah. You can see why she would be labeled folk, but, uh, but Ellen would, uh, would have more, uh, more blues influence and such. Not a whole lot else on her. If you were into music during the, in the, in the late sixties and early seventies, you would know of Ellen McElwain. She passed away nearly uh, two two years ago, nearly oh, okay. to the day. So she passed mm-hmm. away from esophageal cancer, uh, born in 1945, mm-hmm. and passed away recently. So yeah, once a household name in in 1970. So we remember her now. Very nice. So my next uh, band is Thin Lizzy. Thin Lizzy. <clears throat> now I love Thin Lizzy. Rockin', rockin', rockin'. If if you've never heard of them, you you gotta listen to them. Okay, they were an Irish hard rock band formed in dublin uh 1969 we like our irish bands uh mm-hmm. like the cranberries u2 of course or the water boys from yeah yeah uh, yeah mm-hmm. Sinead. yeah Sinead Sinead O'Connor. O'Connor. so two of the founding members of thin lizzy uh bass guitarist and vocalist phil lynette and drummer brian downey they met at a school in dublin in the early 1960s uh, lynette joined a local band the black eagles as vocalist in 1963 and Downey was recruited as a drummer in 1965. Lynette was then asked to join a band called Skid Row, and it's Skid not Row. its not the Sebastian uh. Bach band. It was an Irish blues rock band. After a disappointing television appearance in 1969, uh, he was fired. He remained good terms uh, with uh, Brush Shields, his name was. He was the bass guitarist. I guess he's the guy that formed the band. Mm-hmm. And Lynette then formed Orphanage with Downey on drums. Downey was in a band Sugar Shack, and they had split up. <laughs> I like these names. Sugar Shack. In uh, December 69, uh, guitarist Eric Bell, organist Eric Rixton, they met by chance in a pub in Dublin and found that they shared similar ideas of forming a band. And they decided to visit the Countdown Club, where they saw Lynette and Downey perform with Orphanage. So they decided eventually to form a band. And they uh, agreed on the condition that Lynette play bass guitar as well as sing. And then the band would perform some of Lynette's compositions. So they were original songs. The band started to attract attention in the Irish music press. Uh, it says almost immediately as the band began rehearsals in January 1970. And they were calling them a super group because I guess uh, they were pretty popular uh, between uh, Eric Bell and Phil Lynette. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were popular, I guess, so popular in the area they they knew they knew them, you know. And here they are forming a band together. And the name Thin Lizzy was announced to the press on February eighteenth. Now, did the name come from a friend of theirs named Lizzy who was thin? Mm. Probably not. I'm going to guess not. Was Lizzie Phil Lynette's nickname from his drag queen days? Could be. Neither of those. Oh, okay. The name came from a robot character. No. In the dandy called Tin Lizzie. Yes. Which they adjusted to Thin Lizzie. hmm Because of the reference to the Dublin accent. Right. Where thin, where tin would be, thin would be said as tin. Right. And in, in yeah. the Caribbean as well. Mm-hmm. They say thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and for some of their earlier gigs, the band was mistakenly promoted as Tin Lizzy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first, the band's first gig was at a school near Dublin Airport. <laughs> uh, and then in July 1970, they released a single, The Farmer slash I Need You. The single sold just 283 copies. Hmm. And believe it or not, it is now a collector's item. It was a 45. Yeah. So the one guy left the band before the single's release. It says on Wikipedia, meaning there was a greater share of income for the three remaining members. But I figured it out. A 45 single, if we're going off this single, mm-hmm. cost 95 cents. Mm-hmm. And it would have been $268. 
Yeah, it was a bigger share, but what yeah. what kind of bigger share? Yeah, yeah. You know, are you saying two hundred sixty five dollars split three ways? Or yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Instead of four, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was nineteen seventy. Yeah, 1970. yeah, uh, yeah. Things cost a lot less back then. Yeah, and unfortunately, Rixton died uh, in two thousand fifteen. Mm-hmm. So he had um, rejoined his old band, Them. Oh, that's original. But have by you, the have you heard of them? No. So by the end of 1970, Thin Lizzy were signed to Decca Records. Mm -hmm. Uh, They traveled to London in January 71 to record their debut album, Thin Lizzy. (sighs) Now, the album only sold moderately well, uh, did not even chart in the UK, despite despite airplay. And in March 71, the band permanently relocated to London. They released their EP, New Day. It also had poor sales. But Decca agreed to finance the band's second album, Shades of, Shades of a Blue Orphanage, which was released in March 1972. It's a very unusual title. Is that something that came in a dream, maybe? Well, I think uh, I mentioned that he had a band called Orphanage. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Maybe it was from an orphanage. Yeah. So, musically, the style was Celtic, with little warning of the hard rock direction that the band were to take in the future. Um, oh, so starting out Celtic, really? Yeah. So maybe alternative Celtic, something really unusual, yeah, mm-hmm. happening there. And then in late '72, the band embarked upon a high pri- profile, high profile tour of the UK mm-hmm. with Slade and Susie Quattro. <laughs> out of nowhere, Susie Quattro. Yeah, Susie okay, Quattro. All right. Listeners, if you don't know Susie Quattro, look her up. And around that time, the Decca released Thin Lizzy's version of the traditional Irish ballad, Whiskey in the Jar. Hmm. And I know this song. Yeah, yeah. You, um, wanna, you don't want to sing it for us at this point right now? No. Yeah, okay. But the band was angry at the release, feeling that the song did not represent their sound or mm-hmm. their image. Yeah. But the single topped the Irish chart, reached number six in the UK. This was February 73. And it resulted in them appearing on Top of the Pops. So maybe it was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Like it or not, you're at the Top of the Pop. Yeah. Where did the boys come in? Are we at the boys yet? Not the boys yet. Okay. (laughs) I want to talk about the boys. So soon after, um, Eric Bell left the band. Mm -hmm. And then they did auditions for new members. And they eventually settled on an 18-year-old uh, guitarist, Brian Robertson, mm-hmm. and Scott Gorman, who was from California. 75, early 75, they toured the United States for the first time in support of Bob Seger and Bachman Turner Overdrive. Oh, there's another one. BTO. Yeah. <laughs> they then recorded the Fighting album, 1975, became the first Thin Lizzy album to chart in the UK, reaching number 60. That doesn't sound good. And they also had a successful uh, tour in support of Status Quo. Hmm. That was another band we talked, Jeremy and I talked about. Yeah, yeah. Very little known band, Status Quo. So then in March of 76, they released the hit, The Boys Are Back in Town. The Boys Are Back in Town. So that is the song I know and love. And it reached number eight in the UK and number 12 in the US. The Boys. boys And it was the the first song to chart. The Boys. In the U.S. And here we go with they had the twin guitar sound. Here it is. Had been fully developed by this time. Mm -hmm. And it was in evidence throughout the album. And the album uh, reached number 10 in the U.K., number 18 in the U.S. I remember summertimes, a couple different summers in the 70s, uh, hearing that song, just Mm -hmm. rocking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, boys. That song and this next one, which was their follow-up, Jailbreak, are, mm-hmm. like, I could just listen to them. I don't get tired of those songs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Two big hits, really big hits. Something about the guitar, the riffs, Phil Lynette's voice is kind of unique. I don't think he had the strongest voice, but yeah. it's just, mm-hmm. they remind me of just a bar band. Yeah. A bar band. A really and, good bar band. Yeah. And even when you're listening to the songs, you want to feel like you want to turn around and make sure nobody's like crashing chairs over each other's heads. I mean, that's <laughs> why, you know. You want to punch somebody, but you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So then they toured with uh, Aerosmith, Rush, and Aria Speedwagon. There uh, it is. Yeah. Wow. 
That was in 76. So they'd be friends with, they would be friends with the band members of April Wine then if they're doing all that touring with I'm Rush. I'm sure and, they, yeah. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Make beautiful music together. So they do have, uh, there's a really good album called Live and Dangerous. It's mm-hmm. from 1978. Mm-hmm. Really good live album. If you want to check that out. Also the album Chinatown. Uh, that was 1980. Hmm. Any, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, Chinatown was, uh, I remember that song. I'm sure our local station was big and playing Thin Lizzy. Mm -hmm. Uh, 81, they had their first Greatest Hits album. And now Phil Annette, he died young, unfortunately. And that was pretty much the end of Thin Lizzy. He's got a couple solo albums, too, out. And he was planning his third album. Mm -hmm. But he sadly died uh, in 1986, January 4th, he was 36. Pretty young, yeah. And he had some ailments brought on by his drug dependency, Mm -hmm. uh, which led to multiple organ failure. The remaining members, uh, they actually didn't work together until the recording of the single dedication in October 1990. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they worked in a rough demo of Lynette uh, called Guiding Light into a finished song. Mm Mm-hmm. There's been various small reunions. Um, so the, the band still continues on, believe it or not, huh. um, with various, uh, you know, not original mem- but members they gathered along the way, I mm-hmm. guess. They also go under the name Black Star Riders sometimes. And, but there, is, there was talk and, uh, of putting Thin Lizzy back together from 2022 onwards. Hmm. And I don't know if they did that or not. Yeah. Again, Phil Annette had, and it's L-Y-N-O-T-T. He had such a unique voice and the original band with the original sound. I don't think I'd want to go see Thin Lizzy. With, it's tough uh, when the lead singer passes away. Even if you have some great guitarists, great musicians. I mean, the exception is pretty much Van Halen, I'd say with having a new lead singer, but you still got Eddie Van Halen. Right, right. Which is inc- was an incredible mm-hmm. musician. But uh, to like, continue mm-hmm. on, like like for me, Aria Speedwagon, right? Mm-hmm. Still got Kevin Cronin. I think it's pretty much the original band. But if Ken- Kevin Cronin, something happened to him or he decided to retire and they got someone else, there's nobody like Kevin Cronin. He's got such a unique voice. Right. Yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I do know who would know some of this information about the uh, reunion because uh, my brother in law, uh, oh, yeah, big Kiss fan, but he does not have KISS tattooed across his chest. What does he have tattooed across his <gasps> chest? Could it be Thin Lizzy? So he's got Thin Lizzy, very, wow. very bold. Uh, you know, in I, the lettering style? Yes, yeah, in yeah. the special lettering, yeah. yes, that we know is Thin Lizzy. And there's there's other tattoos, but nothing is bold and big as Thin Lizzy. So he's hmm. uh, definitely, the living down Dallas, Texas, definitely the biggest uh, yeah. Thin Lizzy fan. And uh, a certain style, you know, he just, just loves the rock. I mean, rock I have him. Elvis's signature on my arm. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd have it, like, big across my chest yeah. or, yeah. yeah. You know. Four, four, six inch tall letters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I've seen it. It's real. My next band. uh, Your last band, right? Yes. Last of the three for today. And I like this one the best. Okay. So this is the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Yes. Yes. Uh, They were sometimes referred to as the Dirt Band, or we'll find out later why, the Toot and Commons. Mm -hmm. The Toot. But not the Nitty Gritty. Not the nitty gritty. They were known as the Dirt Band or the Two Uncommons. Uh, started at the year of my birth, 1966. Uh, various uh, people in and out of the band, but started in Long Beach, California. And they were known as the Dirt Band from 1976 to 1981. So you got five years, just the Dirt Band. Mm-hmm. I think it would be just, you know, a nickname because nitty gritty Dirt Band, you know, four words. I kind of like the Dirt Band yeah. better than nitty gritty Dirt yeah. Band. But. Yeah. So uh, we have a wide variety. It's five or six guys, and uh, depending what year you're looking at. But we've got uh, guitarist and washtub player. 
Okay. Yeah, they were a wash jug board. Yeah, wash tub. They said oh, wash tub. Okay. So you take the whole tub with the board in it. Oh, nice. Uh, bassist, uh, clarinet, guitar, harmonica, jug player. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can play a little bit of the jug here for you. Yeah. Yeah. If you had a beer bottle, you could. <clears throat> so, so someone was playing the the jug as well. There was a burgeoning Southern California folk rock musical style that incorporated the you know the hillbillies the beverly mm-hmm. hillbillies playing <laughs> playing the, playing the uh, the jugs yeah uh, they they performed in local clubs wearing pinstripe suits and cowboy boots and uh, you just you just can't you just can't see that and you can't unsee it if you've seen oh, yeah. it before yeah <laughs> so um top hats cowboy hats cowboy boots yeah one is a little tall uh the hat more like a top hat Rob, I I own one of these albums. Okay. And I'm going way back. I'm going way back to when you and I started a friendship, Mm -hmm. and maybe before that, but it was at a fair, and I'm thinking it wasn't the Warren County Fair, but I'm thinking Mm -hmm. it might have been some sort of fair. I won it in like Easton or something. It's bizarre. (laughs) But um, you put a dollar out, which was a lot of money. It's like seven bucks now, five bucks. Mm -hmm. You put a dollar out and try to win an album, which of course was worth how much back then? Oh, an album? Yeah. New. Like, Seven, seven or, seven or yeah, eight, yeah. yeah. So seven, I remember seven ninety eight were on all those albums. The nice price, yeah. The nice price, seven ninety eight <laughs> plus tax. So I put some money down on a wheel and I won an album, and they handed it to me. It wasn't my choice. It was a nitty gritty dirt band. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I bring this album home, right? And this is um, approximately. 1977, 1978. Mm. I'm pretty young. This is some of the first. That's actually might have been my first album I ever owned. I, it was really early. I and your parents said, you ain't listening you ain't to that new, dirt band. <laughs> no. So my parents, and my parents did not have a southern accent either. Yeah. So so my parents listened to classical and then hymns. That's it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'd already been exposed some to Boston, Aerosmith, Van mm-hmm. Halen, Led yeah. Zeppelin. And so this did not fit uh, my style. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I listened to... Probably tried a couple songs and that was it. And I don't know where the album is or what it was. So anyway, you didn't like toss it out the window. No, the car. Um, but you do remember those ones that John Travolta. You do remember that some met destruction by fire when you and I were together. So it could Did have we been in there. Albums. Yes, it could have been in there. <laughs> so, so back to the nitty gritty dirt band. I really like what I hear now. I really like decades later. I really like what I hear. They made success. With uh, Mr. Bojangles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all know. Uh, It was Jerry Jeff Walker's Mr. Bojangles, and their cover version is the one that made... uh, uh, It was a hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 1972's Will the Circle Be Unbroken, which is... um, This was uh, uh, just traditional country artists, uh, Mabel, Mother Mabel Carter, Earl Mm -hmm. Scruggs, Roy Acuff, Doc Watson, Merle Travis. So they were a part of that. What I we... saw, I saw Roy Acuff. Oh, at the Grand Old Opry. Yeah, yeah. It was wow. 1982, and he was probably on his last breath. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. amazing. Anyway, amazing stuff. <laughs> so, you know, when I look at this, and I think, you know, why do why do I like this so much? It is very different than Aerosmith, Boston, Led Zeppelin. But why do I like it so much? There's there's something different here. They were called Southern Rock. They were mm-hmm. also called a kind of folk. So I think being hard to pinpoint leads you to when you're not in a certain genre, you know, because they used to divide, you know, all the, all the, when you would look for LPs, they would divide them up in the genre. You had to go to a certain one, right? Yeah. And so you miss others. So while that can be a detriment, I think it also can be something good because I'm really hearing when I listen to the music now, I'm really hearing something good and something unique there's a banjo there's a harmonica and they're rocking out too you know that's it's pretty cool stuff. yeah you might have thought it maybe it was too mellow or maybe it was like uh not your parents music but other parents music yeah yeah, yeah. for me when i was 13 it was not cool nitty-gritty yeah. dirt band yeah. wasn't cool because yeah. only uh only certain uh certain kinds of rock and roll might as well listen to barry manilow yeah which, you know, I didn't own any, but, you know. Oh, I love Barry. Yes. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? No, you were supposed to just, yeah. you said, the, you said okay. that part out loud. We've got collaborations uh, with many different artists. And they're doing, they're really, they really worked a lot in Southern California. Let's see. 
uh, they became the first American group allowed to tour in the Soviet Union. Imagine that, yeah. Uh, they played 28 sold-out concerts. You know, you just wouldn't think, think Soviet Union, this is uh, before they broke up, and, and Russia being the largest country. You wouldn't think, like, it was the nitty-gritty dirt band that broke through. Yeah. Musically. <laughs> yeah. They in the Soviet Union, you so know. Someone more well-known. Yeah. yeah. Uh, their, their televised appearance is estimated to have been watched by 145 million people. Um, so, they did... Um, they appeared on the second season of PBS's Austin City Limits, which is mm -hmm. still very yeah. popular today. Mm -hmm. So in 1977, they were there. Let's see. Oh, get this. This is really unique. What band appeared live on Saturday Night Live to do just an instrumental? The Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just an instrumental. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I just, I don't know. Maybe some other maybe some other bands have done mm -hmm. that. So speaking of Saturday Night Live, I told you that they were called the Dirt Band. Mm -hmm. They were also called the Toot Uncommons. <laughs> toot. The Toot, toot Uncommons. Toot. T O O T. Yeah. Toot Uncommons. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Because they played on Saturday Night Live with Steve Martin accompanying them on banjo. And they played King Tut. Mm-hmm. And they played along with him, and they called themselves the Tootin Commons. What year? Do you have a year? No, I don't have a year for okay. that. But, you know, King Tut was King Tut in Common, so they yeah. called themselves the Tootin Commons. Yes. That's the album. Yes, there it is. Uh, here at the studio, we have Steve Martin. I'm pretty Martin's. sure that's the album. Yeah. We have the <laughs> album with Steve Martin wearing a... Uh, the balloon Yes, yeah, a animal. balloon, a balloon animal, but it's pressed upon his head. With the fake nose and glasses. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm mistaken. Yeah. I don't think King Tut's on that album. Yeah. It's on, uh, I think, the second album where he's wearing the bunny ears. And yes. it looks like he's on stage. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I can picture that one. Is that one? That called? one's the first one. Is that one called Comedy Is Not Pretty? Or which one? No, is? that was like the third one. Oh, where he's okay. wearing lipstick. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so... Yeah, I would I would encourage our listeners to check out the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. You know, I think now they wouldn't be called uh, American Country Rock or some sort of South uh, California folk. I think they'd be called uh, Roots or Americana or something. You know, mm -hmm. just a bunch of bunch of guys playing their instruments very really well and uh, and really uh, stretching the limits of yeah. the genre. Yeah, uh, just looking at a picture of them in the pinstripe suits, cowboy hats. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, uh, Americana. That's what strikes me now. Mm -hmm. You know, they would, they would fit in at Floyd Fest very well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you have for us? Okay, my last band is Humble Pie, mm -hmm. another food product. <laughs> <laughs> so they are an English rock band, and they were formed by singer, uh, guitarist and singer Steve Marriott in 1969. Now they have had, uh, they only have 11 albums. In 33 years. Mm -hmm. Because from 69 uh, to, let's say, 81, they, were, they had 10 albums. And then in 2002, for some reason, they came out with Back on Track. And that was their mm -hmm. last album. So that was over 20 years ago. Yeah, wow. So from 81 to 2002, that's like, uh, that's 33 years <laughs> in between. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a third uh, of a century off. Yeah. Actually, that's... No, that's 20. 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 23 years. Uh, they're known as one of the first super groups of the late 60s. Hmm. Uh, they found early, uh, they found success in the early 70s with songs such as Black Coffee, not to be confused with Black Coffee in bed. Mm -hmm. 30 Days in the Hole, that's yes. the song I know. Yes. Uh, I Don't Need No Doctor, Hot and Nasty. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably referring to the Hot Pocket or something. I think that's the new Doritos flavor. Hot and nasty. <laughs> nasty. Nasty. <laughs> and Natural Born Boogie. Yeah, the only song I know is 30 Days in the Hall. Right, right. So the original lineup featured lead vocalist and guitarist, as we said, Steve Marriott. He was from Small Faces, huh. which I... Didn't we talk about Small Faces today? I don't with recall. Melanie? That was Rod Stewart's band. No, it's The Faces. Oh. Yeah. I think that's the same... Oh, really? I think it's a, a part of small faces became faces or vice versa. Didn't know that. I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, vocalist and guitarist Peter Frampton. Mm. Now, he was originally in a band called The Herd. So there's a little trivia for you. Yeah. And former Spooky Tooth 
I was going to talk about that band. <laughs> Spooky but, Tooth? Yeah, bassist Greg Ridley. And there was a 17-year-old drummer, Jerry Shirley. He was from a band I've never heard of. Mm-hmm. So Marriott befriended Frampton towards the end of 68, and the pair bonded over their unwanted teen heartthrob status in the UK. Yeah, and I just want to be musicians. Just yeah. let me play my guitar. And their shared desire to be taken more seriously as musicians. Mm -hmm. Frampton was, was at something of a loose end professionally, having recently, recently left the herd, and Marriott, acting as mentor to his younger new friend, agreed to help Frampton find a new musical direction. So Marriott had initially wanted Frampton to join the Small Faces as a second guitarist, and uh, rather than form a new group with him. Mm -hmm. But it was met with resistance uh, from bandmates Ronnie Lane and Ian <laughs> McLoggin. Even though, <laughs> even though Frampton played a few of the band's live shows, and they were well-received by the audience, uh, did nothing to convince Marriott's bandmates. Mm -hmm. So they decided to form their own band, another band instantly labeled by the UK music press as a supergroup. Because hmm. they came from other bands that were popular. Oh, is that what? That's what constitutes a super group. Yeah, you, you yeah. Have yeah, well, you're, you're already well known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, because of that, because they were instantly labeled that, the band chose the name Humble Pie mm. in order to downplay such expectations. Yeah. And uh, they signed with a record label, Immediate records uh their debut album was as safe as yesterday is was released in august 69 and they had the single natural born budgie <laughs> and on the flip side what's, what's a what's a budgie that's a bird a budgie yeah not like a wedgie it's nothing to do with a wedgie when uh jeremy and i talked about brian johnson's book yeah. he mentioned his friend had a budgie <sighs> I think it's... B Did you say natural born but it's budgie? B-U-G-I-E. I thought there was a D in there. I thought there was D, budgie, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe it's boogie, I yeah. don't know. But on the flip side was a song called Wrist Job. So, mm. <laughs> we don't know what that means. Well, this is, this is fascinating with uh, mm. Peter Frampton joining them for a yeah. little bit and mm -hmm. being mentored by one of the yeah. persons in the band. Yeah, it's awesome. So, their single reached number four on the singles chart in the UK. And peaked at number 16. The is album. that Natural Born? No, what? As Safe As Yesterday Is. Oh, As Safe As Yesterday No, is. the singles. Yeah, Natural yeah, yeah, Born. Yeah. Yeah. Boogie, Budgie. Uh -huh. Now, I listened to Wrist Job, and it's, no, it's heavy on the organ. <laughs> it's got a lot of organs yeah, on yeah. to it. That's two words that I, I wouldn't put together. You know, just risk job. Yeah. Like this job is a risk. I'm taking a risk doing this job. Wrist. Wrist job. Oh, they said risk. Wrist. Oh, wrist. Yeah. Uh, now I get it. <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't mention that in the song. No. It's about a girl who leaves uh, the town where he lives. Mm -hmm. It could be a girlfriend, childhood friend that he misses. So mm -hmm. it's actually a good song. And as safe as yesterday was, one of the first albums to be described by the term heavy metal. Oh, wow. But I don't think it's true. It's not true heavy metal, what metal became. Yeah, heavy yeah. metal in the beginning was not, it yeah. became heavier. Yeah, right. And that was from a 1970 review in Rolling Stone. Uh, it's pretty early, 70, yeah. yeah. So their second album was Town and Country, and it was Rush released in the UK because immediate records were on the verge of financial, financial collapse, and the band was away on its first tour of the US. Mm -hmm. And the album featured a more acoustic sound, and songs written by all four members. So Humble Pie concerts at this time featured acoustic set uh, and with a radical reworking of Grand Goldman's For Your Love, which was the Yardbird song, yes, yes. as its centerpiece, followed by an electric set. So it might, that might have been a new concept uh, to do the acoustic <laughs> yeah. and then electric. I had not heard of that. They would do a set acoustic... And then probably kick it in right with the electric uh, for your love, and then had to do an electric set. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, there was a band. I'm thinking it was either Live, the band Live, yes, or Counting Crows that might have done that when I saw them a yeah. while ago, a yeah. long time ago. So the record label collapsed, and Humble Pie actually signed with A and M Records. 
So apparently they were selling some albums and they A&M had an interest in the group. Uh, so the first album with A&M was Humble Pie and it alternated between progressive rock and hard rock. Again, progressive rock uh, being where you're getting experimental, and a lot of this was in the early 70s, and we talked about prog rock before, or progressive rock, really experimenting uh, and trying new things versus, you know, your basic four-piece band just rocking out, just rock, rock, you know, yeah. rocking hard. But it was during this period at Peter Frampton, he acquired his famed uh, Phoenix guitar. Mm -hmm. It's a black 1954 Les Paul Custom, became his signature in instrument. And his favorite guitar for the next decade. Um, so here's a little um, history on the guitar. Humble Pie was playing a run of shows at the Fillmore West in San Francisco mm -hmm. in early December 1970. But during the first show, Frampton was plagued by sound problems. With his then current guitar, a semi acoustic Gibson 335, which was prone to unwanted feedback at higher volumes. So after the show, he was approached by a fan and musician, Mark uh, Mar Mariana. He loaned him the modified 1954 Gibson Les Paul. So by the end of the second show, Frampton had become so enamored of the guitar that he offered to buy it on the spot. And Mariana refused payment. So he played it exclusively for the next 10 years, like we said, and it was actually featured on the cover of Frampton Comes Alive. Now, it was thought to have been destroyed in 1980 when a plane carrying Frampton stage equipment crashed in Venezuela mm. during a South American tour, killing the crew. Mm. But the guitar, in fact, survived the accident with some minor damage. Probably the only survivor was the guitar. Yeah. Wow. And it was eventually returned to Frampton in 2011. I don't know why it took that long to return. Oh, someone someone swiped it and Maybe. kept it and yeah. then finally returned it. That's a great that's a great story. We're gonna have to yeah. look into that one. So in seventy one they released their most successful record to date called Rock On, as well as a live album recorded at the Fillmore East in New York. Uh the live album reached number twenty one in the US. Hmm. Uh certified gold. I don't need no doctor became an FM standard in the US. Oh yeah. But by the time the album was released, Frampton had left the band and he went on to enjoy, of course, solo success. Yeah. Steve Marriott went on to produce. In 75, he did his first solo album. And then in 79, he uh, revived Humble Pie. He added Bobby Tench, former vocalist and guitarist from the Jeff Beck group. Mm -hmm. And along with bassist Anthony Sudi Jones. It says from New York, and they soon secured a recording contract with Atlantic Records, uh, subsidiary Atco. They recorded an album, uh, On to Victory, in 19, they were talking 1980. Uh, Humble Pie toured with Ted Nugent and Aerosmith in 81. Nugent comes up again. I <laughs> and the album Go for the Throat, June <gasps> 81. Yes, Go for the Throat. Yes, I remember that title. So in 82... Steve Marriott formed a new band, but it was also billed as Humble Pie, so it sounds like no original members. Uh, originally, it was to be called the Official Receivers. It says the Three Trojans or the Pie, but ended up billed build by promoters as Humble Pie. Yeah. Yeah, someone else knew who they were and just called it that. Yeah. Trying to camouflage the name, but not able to. So in the 88... There was a new project called New Humble Pie, mm -hmm. or Humble Pie featuring Jerry Shirley, and Jerry Shirley was the only original member. And in 89, they appeared in the lineup at the Woodstock Festival 20th anniversary celebration. Mm -hmm. So the band carried on for the next 10 years. Uh, in 99, Shirley was seriously injured in an auto accident, and he later returned to England. Uh, Frampton and Marriott started collaborating again in 1990. Uh, there were two songs, The Bigger They Come and I Won't Let You Down, with Steve Merritt's vocals, appeared on Frampton's album Shine On, a collection. Mm -hmm. Now, sadly, as in all, not all stories, Steve Marriott died. April 20th, 1991, uh, Marriott and his wife, Tony Poulton, they flew home from the United States where Marriott had recorded songs for a future album with Frampton. This was uh, on the 19th. 
During a flight, uh, according to his wife, he was drinking heavily. He was in a foul mood. And the two argued constantly. Hmm. See where this is going. He took the plane down? No, no. Oh. <laughs> no, this is, this, is a, this is a sad ending. Oh. And one that probably didn't need to happen. But. Mm-hmm. So after arriving in the UK, a mutual friend met them and they all went out to dinner to one of his favorite restaurants, The Straw Hat, where he consumed more al- alcohol. Mm-hmm. After dinner, they returned to the friend's house and decided, decided to stay overnight. Mm-hmm. To consume more alcohol. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was late, uh, but upstairs in bed, uh, Maria and his wife continued to argue. So she fell asleep and later woke to discover that he had taken a taxi to his home in the nearby village of Arkiston. About 6.30 a.m. on April 20th, a passing motorist saw the roof of Merritt's cottage ablaze mm. and called the fire brigade. Mm. Uh, it was reported that four engines were needed to put out the fire, and it is believed that most likely cause of the fire was that soon after he arrived home, jet-lagged and tired, plus he had been drinking, he had lit a cigarette while in bed, mm-hmm. and almost immediately falling into a deep sleep. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So that's very sad. Yeah. So in 2000, Charlie Hun, who became a member of Humble Pie in 88 as the singer, continued on as Humble Pie without Shirley uh, to fulfill live dates. And after completing touring, they disbanded. And then in 2001, Shirley reformed Humble Pie with former uh, Humble Pie member, vocalist, and guitarist Bobby Tench and a new rhythm guitarist who was with Bad Company. They recorded Humble Pie's 13th studio album back on track in 2002. And Shirley appeared at the Steve Marriott tribute concert, which was in 2001. It was the 10th anniversary of Marriott's death. And uh, Frampton was even there mm. at that concert. So in uh, 2018, uh, Jerry Shirley still owned the Humble Pie name. And he instigated a new lineup, which he would direct but not tour with. With this new lineup, they began a 15-show tour of the U.S. uh, in 2018. And believe it or not, they are still performing as Humble Pie Legacy. I actually went on the website. Uh Yeah. Their new tour starts on September 8th in Georgia. Wow. And they are even coming to Red Bank, New Jersey on September 15th. Yes. (laughs) For those in New Jersey, you can check them out at Red Bank. So we don't know who's in the band. Yeah, yeah. He gathered up. Some people and is directing it, but they're not. doing humble pie songs. Yeah, yeah. So. Legacy. So check out yeah. humble pie and what did we tell you? There's two songs, uh, which I don't need no doctor. Uh, hot and nasty. No, we don't want to check that out. Hot. Yeah, I don't uh, need no doctor and forty days. Forty days in a hole. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. So I think that does it. Yeah. Thanks for sticking with us, and uh, we're trying to. Spread the love. Yeah, and uh, music, old and new. Yeah, get into the history. Get into. I didn't know Frampton was so involved in that. You know, there's the we. You know, I like to learn new things about Peter Frampton. I think he was only on the first four albums. Yeah, but. I checked on the web as well, and uh, there's the story of the guitar and its its journey. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, you can search Frampton's dream guitar recovered decades okay. later. Yeah. So uh, he's got it back again. It's it's nice. a wonderful thing. That's yep. a, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, listeners. Thanks yeah. for listening. And uh, turn off the TV and turn up the music. Ciao. Ciao. You've been listening to No Good Music, intro and exit music by the band 99%. Today's show is produced and edited by Rob J. Lilly and recorded at the Did You Say 7 Studios in Washington, New Jersey. You can find No Good Music on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Pandora, and almost anywhere you listen to podcasts.